Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, Neurologist from Rajamandri, Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. Today we are going to talk about a very very important topic Stroke and Hemiplegia Part 7 Investigations of Stroke Stroke and Hemiplegia Part 7 Investigations of Stroke Blood tests These identify underlying causes of cerebrovascular disease we know the risk factors, the diabetes mellitus, dyslipidemia, polycythemia, vasculitis, carousel. So for diabetes mellitus, we check out on the blood sugar levels. For dyslipidemia, we check out on the lipid profile. For polycythemia, we do a full blood count. For vasculitis, we check out on ESR and ANCA for carousel that is cerebral autosomal dominant arteriopathy with subcortical infarcts and leukoencephalopathy we do genetic testing then we can sometimes do lumbar puncture CSF analysis CSF analysis is useful for vasculitis secondary to cerebral infections cerebral infections like tuberculosis and syphilis though they are of long standing they can affect vessels cause vasculitis and can present in a sudden manner so when we suspect vasculitis secondary to syphilitic or tuberculosis infections like meningitis we need to do csf analysis we can also send the CSF for RBCs and xanthochromia for the diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So these are the basic blood tests and lumbar puncture or CSF analysis which we do. Cardiac investigations. Why is it so important? Because approximately 20% of ischemic strokes are due to embolism from the heart so approximately 20 percent of ischemic strokes are due to embolism from the heart so the most common causes are atrial fibrillation prosthetic heart valves other valvular abnormalities and recent mi so these can be identified by clinical examination for example they'll be having irregularly irregular pulse in atrial fibrillation we can do ECG where we can pick out the irregular rhythm. But trans thoracic and trans esophageal echocardiogram may also be required to confirm the presence of cardiac source. CT scan. CT head is perhaps the most important investigation in the evaluation of stroke. CT remains the most practical and widely available method of imaging the brain. It will usually exclude non-stroke lesions including subdural hematoma which could be because of head injury causing a venous rupture and accumulation of the blood underneath the dura or brain tumors. Though brain tumors present in a chronic manner if there's a bleeding into the brain tumor it can also present suddenly a classic stroke mimic so these can be excluded by ct head so ct head it will usually exclude non-stroke lesions including subdural hematoma and brain tumors and will demonstrate intracerebral hemorrhage within minutes of stroke onset however especially within the first few hours after symptom onset the ct changes in cerebral infarction may be completely absent or very subtle therefore mri is preferred 
Sometimes within the first few hours after symptom onset, CT changes in cerebral infarction may be completely absent. It may take 24 hours to 48 hours for the symptoms to be manifest, for the symptoms to be manifest and clearly seen on CT scan. Or it could be only subtle and therefore, when we suspect cerebral infarction, MRI is usually preferred. For cerebral hemorrhage, it is the CT scan which is preferred. For infarction, it is the MRI which is preferred. CT angiography is being used to show vessel occlusion suitable for clot retrieval. MRI brain. MRI brain, especially the diffusion weighted imaging, can detect ischemia earlier than CT and other MRI sequences can also be used to demonstrate abnormal perfusion. So when a person comes with stroke, we first do CT scan to rule out hemorrhage, but CT scan may not pick up infarction and therefore we go for MRI diffusion weighted imaging especially when we are considering thrombolysis. In fact, there are other sequences like diffusion-perfusion mismatch, which is a radiological equivalent of ischemic penumbra. When the perfusion to the brain starts getting decreased, the center part of the brain, there is complete absence of blood flow and the brain is already dead or non-functional we call it as the core infarction surrounding which though there is ischemia and swollen it is still reversible what we call it as ischemic penumbra and surrounding the ischemic penumbra there is normal flow of blood and the brain is normal so this ischemic penumbra where there is ischemia but it is still reversible is very very important even from the treatment point of view because if we thrombolyze such patients, they are likely to recover well. So how do we pick up ischemic penumbra on imaging by a sequence known as MRI perfusion and diffusion mismatch? The perfusion is decreased including the infarct and the ischemic penumbra. So it will be a big area. But when we see the diffusion, only the center core part where there is infarct, we see diffusion only there. So there's a perfusion deficit in a bigger area and diffusion deficit in a smaller area. So there's a perfusion diffusion mismatch above the infarct area, what we call it as the ischemic penumbra. There is ischemia, the brain is swollen, but it is reversible. So MRI diffusion perfusion mismatch is the imaging equivalent of ischemic penumbra. So once we pick this up, we can go ahead with thrombolysis. And MRI is more sensitive than CT in detecting strokes affecting the brainstem and cerebellum. And unlike CT, can reliably distinguish hemorrhagic from ischemic stroke even several weeks of onset. So MRI is more sensitive than CT in detecting strokes especially affecting the brainstem and cerebellum because when you take CT scan head it may show artifacts and therefore the brainstem and cerebellum may not be visualized well. So MRI is more sensitive than CT in detecting strokes affecting the brainstem and cerebellum and unlike CT it can distinguish hemorrhagic from ischemic stroke even several weeks of onset. Yeah, these are the usual investigations we do routinely in stroke patients. But then, stroke may affect young patients also. So, in such persons, young strokes, what are the investigations which we should do to find out, to elucidate the cause of the acute stroke and then manage appropriately. So, causes and investigation of acute stroke in young patients, young stroke. So, young stroke, the causes may be different from the strokes. Uh, which are seen in elderly people because in elderly people atherosclerosis is more common but for young persons with stroke cardioembolic strokes are more common or or uh, persons having uh, altered or highly thrombogenic or hypercoagulable states they are more common so in young person with stroke the investigations differ so we have to approach the person accordingly 
so cause and investigations of young of acute stroke in young patients cardiac embolism very important in young strokes so we need to do echocardiography including trans esophageal echocardiography there could be premature atherosclerosis in young persons with stroke so we need to do serum lipid levels arterial dissection we have to do mri and ct angiogram reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndromes again mri and ct angiogram thrombophilia young stroke always we have to suspect thrombophilia a uh, hypercoagulable state so we have to always rule out protein c deficiency protein s deficiency anti thrombin 3 deficiency factor 5 laden uh, prothrombin then homocysteine urea is also an important cause for young stroke so we have to do an estimation of urinary amino acid and methionine loading test anti phospholipid anti body syndrome can affect both arteries and veins and can present as arterial strokes and venous stroke in fact in if a young woman who's got recurrent abortions and stroke we should always suspect anti phospholipid anti body syndrome so we investigate we have to find out the anti cardiolipin antibodies the lupus anticoagulant for systemic lupus erythematosus uh, we have to do ana estimation for vasculitis example primary angiitis of the central nervous system we do esr erythrocyte sedimentation rate crp and anca for primary intracerebral hemorrhage intracerebral hemorrhage may also affect young patients so what are the investigations and what are the causes for a person having hemorrhage in a younger age group so the primary intracerebral hemorrhage cause and the investigations av malformation is very common generally arteries the blood flows from the arteries to the veins through arterioles capillaries venules and veins so there's a lot of intervening vessels between the arteries and the veins artery arterial capillary venule and veins so the blood goes from the arteries to the veins in this manner but in persons who are having av malformation these intervening vessels are not seen so it's a direct communication between the artery and the vein so there's a high pressure coming from the artery to the vein and it is likely to bleed and cause hemorrhage and persons may present with seizures also so young person with stroke and seizures always we need to suspect av malformation so we did it by mri and mra and another way of finding out av malformation is by giving a contrast or a dye generally it takes a lot of time for the dye to appear in the vein because it has to go to the arteries arterioles capillaries venules and veins so it takes time but in av malformation it's a direct communication from the arteries to the veins and therefore when we give a dye the dye immediately appears in the veins from the arteries because there is no intervening tissue so early dilatation of the vein or early filling of the vein is highly suggestive of av malformation so we can pick it up by mri and mra drug misuse is also one of the important uh, causes of acute hemorrhagic stroke in young patients so we need to do a drug screen like amphetamine and cocaine coagulopathy is very common persons may be taking oral anticoagulants for a particular uh, disorder so we need to do prothrombin time activated partial prothrombin uh, aptt and platelet count persons may be having a, a decreased platelet count and may be having bleeding tendencies so we need to work up with pt aptt and platelet count for sub arachnoid hemorrhage young persons having acute stroke sub arachnoid hemorrhage is also very common usually the bleed is because of the arterial dilatation what we call as berry aneurysm sometimes it is seen in uh, traumatic conditions also so young persons having acute stroke due to hemorrhage we need to suspect sub arachnoid hemorrhage they usually present with thunderclap headache sudden excruciating headache why do they have headache 
it is because the blood has seeped in the subarachnoid space and meninges and meningeal vessels are highly pain sensitive structures they have pain sensitive structures there are no pain sensitive structures pain sensitive receptors in the brain even if we cut brain there is no pain but the coverings of the brain the meninges and the meningeal vessels they have pain receptors and they are highly sensitive to pain that's why headache is seen whenever the meninges get affected be it subarachnoid hemorrhage where there's a bleed in the arachnoid membranes meninges and causing irritation or meningitis where there's infection of the meninges both produce severe headache and neck stiffness so subarachnoid hemorrhage is one of the important causes of young stroke in young patients uh, with hemorrhagic tendencies so subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, sackler or berry aneurysm is very common we pick it up with mri or mra again av malformation is very common we pick it up by mri and mra and vertebral uh, dissection we pick it up by mri and mra yeah these are all the very important salient investigations we need to do when we approach a person with stroke and try to evaluate the cause very important investigations the investigations might slightly differ from a person from an elderly person with stroke and a young person with stroke and we need to go accordingly so these are all the important concepts of investigations of stroke i hope you have enjoyed listening to my lecture as much as i have enjoyed delivering the lecture uh, this is the book focused neurology i have uh, written i am the medical author dr srinivas this book is available online from all leading book stalls including amazon you can book it online so after having listened to this lecture if you have any suggestions or comments kindly post on to my youtube channel dr srinivas medical concepts or my fb page dr srinivas concepts or you can get in touch with me by uh, posting your comments on my email sriklpm@gmail.com but please like and subscribe my youtube channel Dr Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr Srinivas Concepts thank you bye